Okay, right now we're sitting with Tony DiTerlizzi, who is the author of Star Wars, The Adventures of Luke Skywalker, Jedi Knight, along with the legendary Ralph McQuarrie. Maybe you can start off by telling us, first of all, why Ralph McQuarrie is legendary. Ralph McQuarrie is legendary because he was the um, original illustrator for Star Wars. So if you can imagine a time when Star Wars wasn't the ginormous film franchise it is now, um, George Lucas was working on his script in the, in the mid-1970s, and he had hired a couple of concept artists to design um, some of the characters and model builders to build some of the, what would be the spaceships. But, but Ralph came in and took those designs and painted these unbelievable uh, paintings, images of what Star Wars could look like. And at the same time, he's designing Darth Vader, R2-D2, C-3PO, uh, the Death Star. And so it was, uh, you know, I'm, I would assume like Walt Disney did the similar things in an animated feature um, for the, the Disney Studios would make. But to see a live action uh, director and film uh, incorporate these beautiful um, like acrylic and gouache paintings for a movie were unbelievable, and, and George held on to these paintings uh, over the years. He hired Ralph for um, A New Hope, what we call A New Hope now, Star Wars, um, uh, Empire Strikes Back, my favorite film, and Return of the Jedi. And so over the course of the years, he amassed you know, a couple hundred paintings by him. It's amazing that how exact they got it. I mean, there's no doubt that like in some of those early paintings that you've seen, there's some changes in different things. Yeah. But for the most part, the movie looks strikingly like McQuarrie's drawing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I think Ralph was probably, again, probably immersed in a team, um, or, or, you know, obviously centered around George. And um, I, think, uh, I think a lot of it was like a creative dialogue between George and Ralph. And that's what I really loved about this project, because at that point, Star Wars is very similar to a picture book, to any kind of book that's getting illustrated. It's words and pictures. And so that excited me greatly about this. So what, how, when did you get the call to be a part of this? <laughs> and what, what was that feeling like when the phone rang and you, and you got to you know, take <laughs> The R2-D2 phone. phone rang. And yeah. then, no, I mean, the, the, they called um, uh, last fall. Um, I was finishing up uh, the Wandla trilogy, the big science fiction trilogy. And the folks at Lucasfilm knew I was a huge uh, Star Wars fan. And, and the caller ID was, said Lucasfilm. I mean, come on. I should have taken a photo of that. How often <laughs> yeah. are you going to get that? And um, they said, you know, we know you're a huge Star Wars fan. We have these, these images of Ralph's. So we would love to do uh, a retelling of the original film trilogy. And we think you're the guy for it. And then, you know, I passed out, you know, it's, you know, and picked myself up off the floor and said, yeah, of course. I'd be honored. I'd be... You do, you do, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm more, more known as an illustrator. I mean, I write and illustrate most all the books I do. Um, and so to be asked just to write the star, you know, for, for, for children, how could I say no? It's amazing. So once you say yes, though, the enormous pressure of the Star Wars fandom on your back <gasps> and, all the, uh, <laughs> and all the people who know who Ralph McQuarrie is yeah. and, and, and you, for, uh, who were a fan yourself. I mean, what is that like? Once you said, got past the euphoria of getting the job, all yeah. of a sudden you then the reality go, you sets go in. Do it. Oh, yeah. what did I've done? Yeah. Well, I, um, I, you know, I think about my, my daughter is seven, and in her class, a lot of her friends are into Star Wars. So I knew it still existed with children today, that they really still loved it, enjoyed, enjoyed it. So I thought back to. Um, how it felt for me when I saw Star Wars in 1977 and as a kid growing up in the 70s with Star Wars and now as a parent sitting down with her to watch Star Wars and what you get out of it. So actually what I did is the first draft that I wrote, I just wrote it from memory. I figured if I, whatever I remembered from Star Wars had to be important. It had to, if, it were, if it was still sticking with me, there, were, there must have been a reason, a reason I may not even be aware of. And so I did that before I sat down and rewatched the films. And the thing that I remember, Rich, I don't know if you remember this, but Star Wars comes out in 1977, right? The toys, the Kenner toys that so many of us grew up with playing came out the following year, right? And Empire comes out a couple years after that and then Jedi. But Star Wars only existed in movie theaters. It didn't come out on videotape until after Jedi, so in the mid-'80s. So for me, Star Wars existed not in repeated watchings of a film, but in books and toys and dressing up like Luke Skywalker and running around the yard. It existed in my imagination. I suspect it probably did the same for a lot of, a lot of children who are now you know, storytellers. So I wanted to try to capture some of that 
So I put a lot of like sound effects, I, uh, the lines that are, Luke, I am your father, and help me Obi-Wan Kenobi. I wanted to put those and highlight those through the book because those are the lines that I remember that, I, that I'm very fond of. And then a lot of the sound effects because when I played, I was always like, <laughs> you know, always making sounds. <laughs> Yeah, those lightsaber sounds are great. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no doubt. There's some memorable elements of that that movie, but you know, you think back to when 1977, when you're a kid in that movie theater, that yeah. darkened movie theater. You didn't have, you weren't able to watch it over and over again. So it really did exist wholly in your memory after you saw it. Maybe you'd see it a second time, or even yeah. a third, but it was that one time hit. Could you have ever imagined though that someday, like, I mean, you you were probably a creative kid, but but that sort of arc to now being a part of the franchise, it's such an amazing run that when you start to look back and see how it all ties together. It's, it's a little surreal, I gotta be honest with you, and, and um, um, it's very validating for me because I think, um, you know, I mean, Star Wars is, it, along with many other things, Dungeons and Dragons and, and, and video games and The Hobbit and all the things that I loved when I was that age are all part of the fabric of me as a, as a person and a storyteller. But to have it come back around, for, 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 the, for this company to be like, you're such a good, beloved children's storyteller that we want you to be the one to write this version. What do you, I mean, that's, yeah. I'm waiting for my mom to wake me up and I'm like <laughs> 11 again. I got to go to school for my, you know. Does your daughter understand the, um, I mean, she's seen it probably a few times herself. Yeah. Does your daughter understand that this is a darn cool thing right here. I have your name right here and his name right there. You know, It's very, very, uh, she, she gets it. I think she gets it as, as much as she can. Right. Um, and you know, we, the thing that I was super excited for, I waited seven years for this. This Halloween, she said, Dad, let's go as Star Wars characters. And I was so jazzed and I was like, oh, you know, who are you gonna be? And she's like, I'm gonna be Princess Leia. And she was very specific about the Princess Leia. And I'm like, with the, with the bun? She's like, no. I want to be Princess Leia with when she's on the speeder bike. She was very specific, <laughs> which I like. Costume. And I said, finally, I can be Han Solo. Now I'm a man. I can right. feather my hair, put on my skinny jeans, right? And I'm like, do you want me to be Han Solo with the vest? Or do you want me to be where he's wearing that blue, like, members only jacket? Yeah. And I'm showing her all the photos. And I swear to God, is what she said. She's just laughing. And she goes, you're too old to be Han Solo. You should be Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> oh, no. So it was right. a little bittersweet. Yeah, but yeah, she gets call. it. She wake gets up it. Call, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Well, the that's book is, is truly beautiful. It's amazing. I want to talk a little bit about your own work, too. Yeah. Um, I first got to know your work from The Spider of the Fly, which my kids loved. Um, then they devoured Spiderwick Chronicles, yep. and then in those were made, in, that was made into a movie. And, yeah. and you continue to create this amazing work um, yeah. that's a mix of your passion, illustration, and, yeah. and words that you yeah. now in the middle of too. Can you talk a little bit about your, your latest series, The Battle for Wanla, and how that all evolved and, and what's happening there? Yeah, the Wandla trilogy kind of came out of, actually out of Spiderwick, because I was uh, kind of devising the mythology, the backstory of the Spiderwick Chronicles. I was fascinated by the idea of a story that had happened in the past, the story of Arthur Spiderwick coming forward in time to present day and affecting modern day kids. So immediately, my brain flip-flopped that and said, well, what about a story from the future coming back to present day? And so uh, if you looked at my sketchbooks as I was designing and developing what would become Hogsquill and Thimbletack, there would be the characters from the Wandla books. And it, and it mulled. I had to mull it over uh, for a while. And I didn't feel like I was ready for it. I knew it was going to be longer and richer than Spiderwick. I knew I really wanted to try to tackle it on my own to see if I could write something that, you know, that epic and big and um, and I don't think I would have done it right away had my daughter not been born and I hadn't turned 40 I felt like you get in that place and you're like this the time is now for me to tell a story like this and so it's it's a mix of, of, of science fiction and, and my love of fantasy and classic books I love stories like The Wonderful Wizard of Oz uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Peter Pan I love those books I, I read them as a kid my mom read them to us I've returned to them many times, and I started to wonder why I like those stories. And a lot of them are about um, young female protagonists who leave like their comforts of home and go out into a Neverland or a Wonderland and kind of gain an understanding of, of home and a family before they return. And I really like the idea of that a lot. So I wondered if I could tell like a, a 21st century version of that. So maybe instead of like 
of Tin Man, I'd do robots. And instead of Mad Hatters, I'd have aliens and stuff like that. And it started out with that. Like, I started out with this girl named Eva Nine, who's 12, raised by robots on an alien planet. And she realizes there's no other humans on the planet. So she has to try to find, you know, what defines then home? What defines family? You know, is it the family that's your, that's your blood? Or is it the family you find, the people who care for you? And as the stories went on, it kind of just became a dialogue within me, I think as being a new parent, and kind of for the first time in my life really reflecting on, on modern man in, 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 in the world. Like, is, is technology, do we, do we rely on technology too much? Is technology a good thing or a bad thing? Um, are we really the best caretakers for this planet in the end? And, and it doesn't answer those questions, it just asks those questions. And I think it was just me having this dialogue, trying to work it out, sort it out, as a, as a now a, um, you know, a middle-aged dude and a dad. Um, and so I finished it in the spring, and I, and I felt it was very cathartic for me. It felt really good. I felt like it was a, definitely I had cut a wedge out of my heart and put it in those books. So it means a lot. It means a lot to me when I um, get parents that are like, I, we've been reading a chapter tonight. We both really love it. That's, that's gold to me, the idea that it's, that it's working on two levels, a, a child's enjoying it, but also an adult's enjoying it with them. Oh, I, I can tell you that many adults thank you for that. I mean, <laughs> there's something that works on those multiple levels. There's been many nights where I find myself fading, but even books I love, but yours definitely pull you in and on those two levels, and, and it's remarkable to watch kids engage, and there's so much detail and depth. Kids get it immediately, too. Yes. Yeah. I feel like they're all smarter yeah. than I was when I was their oh, age, absolutely. more savvy, more, more acute, and, and picking up on things Completely. like that. Completely. And they become little storytellers themselves in a way yeah. that Gosh, I hope so. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, I, I've now, you know, yeah, we've, we've known each other for a while. I've toured now for over a decade, and, and most of my book tours have me, um, like, this, like this book fair, I'm, 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 I'm talking to schools. I've been to schools all over the country. And what I find fascinating is if I'm going to like an elementary school, so like say kindergarten to like say fifth or sixth grade, and I ask them who here likes to write, you know, almost all the hands go up. <laughs> who here likes to draw? All the hands go up. You go to a middle school, about half the hands go up. Go to a high school, it's like, you know, yeah. two dudes and one weird art chick, and that's <laughs> it. <laughs> I don't know off. what happens. I don't yeah. know why that's not encouraged as much. Something does fall off. It's weird, I'm not sure. And I'm the product of, of parents and a few teachers in my life, select people who saw it and just encouraged it when it could have been so easily discouraged. I mean, there's no special training. It's just kind of that kid who's got their head in the clouds who, who's always daydreaming and imagining about things like, like Star Wars or the Dark Crystal or, or you know, now it'd be you know, Avatar or Guardians of the Galaxy. They, they're just so inspired by those things that they want to make their own little comic books or write their own stories. Yeah, it's great, and I hope that they do, more do, but I'm glad you did. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the Star Wars book is a, is a delight. I think the fans are going to certainly devour it, but um, I'm glad that you're finding new stories to tell as well, and it's really great to have you here at the Nine Book Fair International on PBS. It's great to be yeah. here. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, sir. Yeah, take care. Yep.